Hi. Uh, we're going to do something a little different today. I have a very good friend of mine here in the shop. His name is Thomas Muramatsu from Thomas Muramatsu Stringed Instruments. He's located in Belgium and Japan, uh, Brussels and Tokyo. Um, so if you want an instrument built, please uh, reach out to him. But Thomas and I have known each other for about 15 years, I think. Quite a it's yeah. about how long? Yeah. We actually used to work together as musicians. And um, I didn't realize it until about three or four years ago, but we actually share a passion for woodworking. Um, I tend to focus more on furniture, but uh, Thomas loves to make instruments. And as I just mentioned, he now has a company that makes instruments. And he has uh, breathed a new life into a Baroque instrument called the uh, Viencello de Spalo. Right, mm -hmm. Spala? Vincello. Vincello. Spala. Yeah. Spala, yeah. right? Um, which is this instrument right here, which he uh, just finished making a couple months ago. Like myself, Thomas is also a traditional woodworker. He does everything by hand, uh, so he doesn't use any power tools. So he can explain a little bit about some things that he's noticed, uh, differences in techniques and approaches to design and instrument making in particular. But first, I want to I want you to explain why why this instrument? Why did you decide to make this instrument? So it all started when I saw a video on YouTube, like you know everyone, about it's, it's close to 15 years ago, I guess it's a long time ago of, of a guy playing this instrument, and I was I was struck with uh, by the sound, by the look, by everything that this is. And especially because to me as a guitarist, did you mention I was a guitarist? No, I didn't. I just that's your position. He's a guitarist. I'm a guitarist. Right. I'm a guitarist. <laughs> so, um, and to me as a guitarist, this spoke to me. It was like the guitar version of a violin. So basically, it's a cello. It's tuned like a cello plus a higher string, but the sound is quite different from the modern um, cellos. It's somewhat closer to to a guitar, and I use a strap and hold it against my chest like this to play this instrument, in, which is also somewhat close to the guitar. So your hand, your wrist position is closer to the guitar, yeah, as opposed to a violin, yeah. which would be out here. Yes, right. Like this, right. So for you, it feels more natural to play. Yeah, it is. And as, as a guitar player, especially as an archtop guitar player, um, I've always kind of envied the classical look and feel like you know the tradition of the violin families it's like it has more history it looks gorgeous and everything so this was like just right for me what are the woods that you use on this instrument so i use uh, spruce for the top and maple for pretty much everything else except the, the black part you see this uh this and this are ebony veneers two millimeter thick and these are carved from uh, ebony too so Thomas was born in Japan and raised here, so he is very familiar with both Western and Japanese tools. And um, like myself, I've been in Japan for about 25 years, so I've used both Japanese and Western tools. And I find that for certain tasks, um, a Japanese tool can be better than a Western and vice versa. So we were talking about this earlier, and with Thomas, uh, when he makes a spala, when you make the back, I guess the back and the front, I guess you refer yeah, to yeah. it, right? The back and the front. These are actually, if you look close, there are two pieces of wood that have been butt jointed. You can see the seam here. So when you make this, I mean, I can see it's been butt jointed, but it's also curved and you've, been, you've shaped it. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you started out with wood that was thicker and then you planed it down and shaped it. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So we were talking about planes and you said that when you used to make this butt joint, when you used to joint the edges mm -hmm. of the two boards, you used to use a, a Western jointer. Yep. But then you switched. I switched to Japanese planes uh, recently, actually. The issue was... Um, well, let me stop you there for a second. Yeah. Did you switch to a, a Japanese jointer, the same length? No, I, I switched to a, a regular sized Japanese plane. The, okay, so kind of yeah, like... This is a little size. narrower, so... It's a little wider than this one, but basically, yeah, that's uh, okay. That's, that's about it, yeah. And why, why this, why the switch? What was well, different? The, the thing is, like, to get a perfect fit, 
um, everywhere it has to be well technically it has to be com completely straight right I don't make it completely straight actually I make it very very slightly concave slightly con concave yeah not convex concave yeah okay that that way the clue the hide glue pulls it together completely shut oh yeah. but we're only so, talking about you know a you hair. don't see it you don't yeah, see you don't it, right? see it so how do you measure that then is it a feel thing how it's, can you it's tell? more like a feel thing yeah actually um when you put two boards together uh well actually can i yeah of course yeah so when you plane both both edges and then you put it together and you kind of kind of rub it move it right to check and you feel it you can yeah right 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 yeah well That's we do that feel, when yeah. you're when you're jointing edges anyway you yeah, do yeah, that yeah. to see right. if, if if there's a hump and in then, there okay yeah the hump or that like like where where it's it's rubbing sure. it. okay. so yeah it's kind of a, a feel thing but you if you see it it's way too much right right, so right. technically it's it's straight right um so when you yes, use yes. when you apply the hide glue then I am assuming you clamp it or do you not uh, I don't have to clamp it because I, the hide uh, the yeah, hide glue will yeah, pull it together. If the joint is good, I do put a clamp just for safety. Right. Uh, well, I also switched to using just one clamp in the middle. Okay. Right. I used to use uh, three or four clamps. Right. A lot of people use more clamps too, but I I I, yeah, I switched to using just one in the center. Okay. And just just to hold that in place. Right. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So we were discussing this earlier, and you said that when you butt jointing, the reason you switched from a Western plane to a Japanese plane is because you weren't able to get the edges as flat as you needed them, right? Yes. Yeah. So what's why the tolerance? Why does the butt joint for the back of an instrument need to be so perfect? Because for you know for a tabletop. It's not that big of a deal, yep. as long as it goes together and there are no gaps, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, these are carved down to like a very, well, carved down very much. It's it's like two millimeter. At you the, mean plane down or carved down? It's carved. Well, carved. We, we call it carved. You call it's okay. carved saw. It's, well, you can use a, a plane or anything. Okay. Yeah. If, if it's the outside, you can even use small flat planes. Uh, okay, but yeah, we we use finger planes most of the time. Or, right, right, right. Or gouges for the big cuts. Okay. Um, but yeah, these were like one one inch to one inch and a half thick at the beginning. So about thirty millimeters. Yeah. Three centimeters. Okay. Yeah, three 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 point five something like that. Um, so you started off with boards about that big. Yeah, that big. And then you boards jointed or, the or edges. Wages sometimes. And then you butt jointed them. Yeah. And then you and shaped. Then you yeah, we carved so. When you see it like this, so this was the top side, the top edge of the joint, and this is closer to the bottom edge, edge of the joint. And um, you can't really plan completely ahead where it's going to be the, the final, like, remaining what the part, part you see, right? right. So, so everything has to be perfect. Or so what you're saying then see. is because you're, you're butt jointing two thick boards together and mm -hmm. then you're planing them thin, if that if those edges aren't completely straight you might get a gap as you plane yep. down mm -hmm. so even though it looks good on the top as you start to plane through that joint you might see little gaps yeah. or have them revealed or, or it could be like just a weak weak spot or a weak spot yeah. so okay one last question um, when you're designing an instrument mm -hmm. are there a set is there a set pattern that you design an instrument by like if this is a spala is this going to be the exact same dimensions as any other spala that, that I see or hold? No. Um, basically, well, it depends how you approach it. I don't approach it like that. You don't approach it like yeah, that? Yeah, I don't, I don't approach it like that. And your but approach is more classical in terms of luthier I mean, instrument making? I'm, actually, I shouldn't say luthier. classical because uh, there's a thing, uh, a whole world we call classical luthery. Classical luthery. Okay. Which, which refers to, usually refers to like violin making and stuff like that. Okay. Um, but the modern ways to make or especially design violin, most most makers don't design their violins. They copy the good models, like the, the Strat model. The Stradivarius, yeah. right, right. Yeah, or that. Um, and those ways of making or those 
type of uh, philosophy for designing was born in the 1700s, like uh, from the first book I think was published in, in 1740 about violin design, which was more of a mathematical approach to, to designing the instrument. Okay. And before that, um, people were using um, a much more natural way, basically. You use proportions, uh, so relative proportions. So this uh, one part always relate to another. Relative proportions. Yeah. It's not like just like, you know, this is uh, 100 millimeters and, and you have to use this like in right. 3 millimeters. So you're not, like you're not that. measuring out every aspect of the instrument. Mm -hmm. So there are like important factors like the, the width of the upper bar, the middle bar, lower bar. And those are proportionally related. And then I link everything freehand using my body. Okay, so, I don't so give, give me an example. So basically... Um, if you have, if you grab a pencil, there's a pencil right there. Right? Okay, okay. in the sax, <laughs> the bell. So basically, if I want to draw this on a, on a paper, right? Because I have to draw it on a paper, right? Uh, in, instead of using a, a compass or, or a curved, uh, you don't Some, call it something curved shaped, shaped, right? Yeah, something right. curved shape, right? Yeah, yeah, right. I can just use my hand because my hand, the body moves. It's never straight, right? It right. has a natural curve. Right. So I just use the movement of the body to draw a natural looking curve. And I connect the points basically that I, uh, which I can Which you set. which you can do because these are small diameter curves. You can do big ones too. Uh, by just using your elbow? Yeah. Using your elbow, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So like if like on my um on my lid here. I'm making a, making a lid for a box. This is going to be next week's video. So I want to do a curved edge mm -hmm. on that. So if you were going to do that, you would do something something like this? Kind Some of. Some motion? But it will probably look... Well, it actually, it probably depends. You have to test. You have to, yeah, you have test. to test your movement okay. because everyone's different, right? Right, right, right. Uh, for me, I would start from here like this and from here like this. If I make one motion like this, the center will be a little, a little it off. It won't be. Uh, and that okay. you can see. So you do one side at a time yeah. to keep it symmetrical. It, well, I, it, doesn't, it actually right. doesn't have to be symmetrical. But right. the center better be pretty much in the center. More or less at the center. <laughs> right, Because right, that's right. something you can actually see. Okay. Um, the curve being, being like symmetrical, it it's really, really doesn't matter for, for many reasons. But one is that Normally, in like naturally around us, there's nothing that's symmetrical. Right. Our face Nature is completely is is sure. asymmetrical. Sure, sure. Um, so it's actually when you get used to it, like it looks unnatural to have like a completely symmetrical look. Right. Right. It's almost too perfect. Yeah. Right. It's like oh, there's something weird. It's like a, a fake. Which actually looks. is the exact reason why I love using hand tools as opposed to. Uh, machines because you have those little idiosyncrasies mm -hmm. in whatever you build it's mm -hmm. not exactly perfect right that's what that's what gives it character in my yeah. opinion that's what yeah. gives a piece of furniture character is to have those little imperfections mm -hmm. it's kind of like jazz kind of, yeah. <laughs> especially like saxophones yeah, yeah. Jazz, in music uh, instruments right <laughs> yeah. yeah it's it's more made I think of that's why that's why we like woodworking yeah. too <laughs> very linked <laughs> yeah. well that's fascinating so when you create an instrument you're dealing with proportions and you set those proportions pretty much arbitrarily. Like it, you could say that you're going to use this distance to be a unit and then you're going to base the whole instrument off of this unit. Yeah. As long as it's proportioned, then it would be, it would be a spala. Yeah. No matter it, whether it was eight feet mm -hmm. tall or, or six inches tall, mm -hmm. because of the proportions, it would still be a, Basically, yeah, yes, yes. the spala yeah. is the basic. Yeah. It is. But I do it the other way, so I have a, a bigger one. A bigger what? <laughs> that is uh, my one, the, the unit of oh, one. Oh, okay, right, right. That, that unit is, it's like, right. It's, it's not the small one in, that I might multiply. I okay. take a bigger measurement and um, and then I cut it. You divide it. Divide it. For the proportions, Using right. intervals. Intervals. So, so, 
Perfect which are thieves, oh, perfect fourth, like musical intervals. Intervals. But those don't those don't indicate length. So when you say interval, well, if you have a length, and then talk about intervals, it does indicate length actually. Well, I mean, you're because a you're half is going to be an octave. Right? right. You're you're talking yeah. about. Okay, yeah, but so but, but you're talking about dividing it and then dividing it again mm -hmm. to get equal equal parts from a specific length is what you mean. When you mean intervals, yes. each of those intervals are are equal. Um, like if you cut something in half, yeah, theoretically yeah. it should be. And and when it's half, it's pretty much it. But uh, as you know, when it's like major third, major fourth, it's not like. Completely. These are, these are musical terms here. Yeah, he's yeah, talking yeah. about. Yeah. If you're a musician, you yeah. understand, right? Yeah, it's right. so it's it's slightly like off, a uh, perfect equal. Uh, okay. So when I'm making a musical instrument, then I, I kind of uh, I use I actually use a string. I I I make a monochord, which has like two strings basically because it's easier. I have two two strings. Two string. strings on like a board yeah, or something. Yeah, on a board or something. Yeah. or something. Like that? Yeah. Okay. And so this is this has to be the unit of one for me. This has to be the length, the base length. Okay. And then I have a small movable bridge. So a bridge is is like like this part that's, that supports the string. Right. So I can shorten the length of one of the strings, which will change the pitch of the one one of the strings. Right. The actual strings on this. like a B and a C. So if you were to use that to determine your proportions, mm -hmm. how would you use it? You ready to film one? I'm filming. Okay. So um, if I use this uh, to determine my proportion, I set, uh, I set the length, the unit of one for me, the basic unit for me. Um, so that between those two bridges yeah. is your your unit Basic. of length yeah. of one. Yeah. Okay. And then, so this is, let's say this is a C, right? This is a C. Mm -hmm. And then I would move it. This is like an octave. That's an octave, much. right? Yeah. That's a one C above the C that we were just playing. Pretty much. And, well, an octave, it's easy. I know it's half the length, so I don't really have to measure it. But this is the basic uh, principle. So I could do from... I would, I would uh, place it to a major third, and then take the measurement from here to here. So that, sound-wise, that length is giving you a major third, and yeah, that would much. be the length of, like, for example, what? You mean what uh, on the instrument? On the instrument, what would that be the length of? It could be. Could be anything. Uh, it could be the the length of the body. Um, could be the the length of the fingerboard. Could be the length of the the baseball inside. Could be many things. You have to you have to use this measurement, but then you have to test the design on on paper um, to see if it looks right to you. So Just, after you get that proportion, you yeah. sketch it out. Yep. Full size. Full size, yeah. To see I mean, if it, the proportions it could be like smaller, but it's yeah, definitely it's full size. It's easier. You you can make actually make sure. So, I I always say, um, draw full size, whatever you're building. Draw a, a drawing full size, and then you your eyes to determine if it's if it looks perfect to you, then it is perfect. Because sometimes you can measure a perfect thing and and write it down. It just doesn't look perfect, right? Right. So the main what perfect is is actually what you 
It's in the eye of the beholder, as they say. Yeah, it's like if if you look at it, it looks perfect to you, then that's definitely perfect. Like you can make sure one hundred percent that that is perfect. Uh, so I I personally um, learned and and heard of it first from from a luthier, but I read also a book written by Vitruvius, uh, which is Vitruvius. Called, yeah, Vitruvius. It's like a uh, ten books on of architecture, something like that. Uh -huh. so it's, it's pretty much the the oldest book on architecture that survived uh, through history and it was written in BC 1. 1 BC? Yeah. Wow. Uh, 1 okay. BC you said. 1 BC, yeah. I, I didn't know that. Um, and so... So a book, a book by Vitrius, uh, Vitruvius, Vitruvius yeah. on architecture that was written in 1 BC yeah. and you read it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, okay. it's probably well, well, translated. I it. I right? Yeah, I believe it. No, no. It's translated. I don't think you read it in the original yeah, language, yeah. sure. And yeah. he said... So... Uh, it, it's a book about how to um, how to design architectures and uh, a lot of other things. And on, in book five, he's talking about how to design amphitheaters. Amphitheaters. Yeah, amphitheaters. Yeah. Um, and he's explaining how to use musical intervals to decide a certain part of the theater so it amplifies the, so it the amplifies voice of the, the sound. Singer. Right. Well, an amphitheater is basically a big instrument. Yeah. So he's explaining That's fascinating. Uh, how they use that, how you should use that to amplify that. And he's also uh, mentioned that that's how uh, instrument makers are making their instrument. Wow. Yeah. So that goes back over 2,000 years, mm -hmm. that method of construction. Right. And you're passing down that knowledge and that generation mm -hmm. through your instrument making. Basically, yeah. That's fantastic. Hey. I appreciate your time by, man. It's been a while since I've seen Thanks, you. Thanks, man. Thanks for having so, me. So, like I mentioned, uh, Thomas Muramatsu, uh, luthier in Brussels and also in Tokyo. Uh, I'll link, I'll put a link to all his uh, Instagram, all that information in the description. Please check him out. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.